sure get that. <laughs> you couldn't make it left right. Yeah. <laughs> We're trying to get Steve's laptop working without oh. Steve. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> ha! Promotion! <laughs> Steve! We <We're> rule! <laughs> you press stop and start. Excellent work! But you might have got a nice video. Does that make you my apprentice? <laughs> <laughs> you Virtual tour of the. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> made it into anything yet today. <laughs> um, so, for those of you that I have never met, uh, or casually met, uh, my name is James McNally. I am a member of CSLUG, so the Central <coughs> South Lab User Group, um, of which there's many other members, I think there's been a few presentations already from as well. Um, and this is a presentation that I developed um, actually originally out at NI Week, and I thought I, it was a good thing to bring for this as well. Um, so, I can't remember exactly what the title was I put on the agenda, because they always ask for these things a bit before I've thought it all the way through. Uh, <laughs> but the mo most appropriate title I could come up with is My Everyday Lessons in Loop. So oh, very close. Practical lessons in that. <coughs> ah, there we go. <laughs> so, hopefully this is kind of practical, um, as practical as Loop tends to get. Uh, what I really want to share with you is, I guess, some of the ways that I've changed my thinking over a couple of years now of, of using this in LabVIEW, uh, and I guess some of the sort of thought processes I go through as I work through, um, which hopefully grounds it a little bit more than some of the more fluffy kind of design concepts. So I think the first question with all of this is often, why do I care enough to come and stand up and talk to you all about this? Um, well, there's a couple of steps. The first thing is, um, I'm a big believer in kind of iterative development in software. Um, obviously, agile is a big buzzword. Um, I kind of like that term sometimes and not other times, depending on how it's used. Um, but I think even if you're not formally doing agile, there's always an iterative element. You're always working on something and improving it over time, uh, whether that means that you actively do that as part of development, or maybe you've got a system that's been around for five years and each year you're doing incremental updates. And I think in order to do that, you have to have well-crafted software, you have to have good modularity, loose coupling, and I think OOP or the object-oriented design principles are one of the best ways to achieve that. The problem is I found a big learning gap when I actually sat down to try and do this. So it's kind of somewhat of a classic story. Of <coughs> I learned all the principles. I actually taught the courses at NI. Um, I could tell you, you know, how many members should be in a class and what inheritance is and how it works. But when it actually comes to sit down and write in a big language, a big project, uh, I found there's quite a learning gap between how do I make a class to when do I? What makes this two classes or one class? What should I call this one? How do I split up this software? 
And so I think I've bridged this gap fairly well. What I'm hoping to do is save somebody in this room maybe two years and, and help you to get to that point a little bit sooner than I did. So I've kind of structured this as four or five different lessons as we go through. Um, they roughly relate to each other, but um, feel free to ask me questions on a lesson at that point because the subject will change possibly rapidly at points. <laughs> so the first lesson um, for me really was you can't be too modular. I, I didn't ever find a point where making a module smaller felt like a waste of time. Um, so really that object oriented has helped me with that because I used to start with quite big classes. Um, I might have a class that manages a whole process and holds all of the data for that process. It's kind of a fairly classic first step into to object oriented programming. But slowly I broke that down smaller and smaller and my diagrams got smaller and smaller. And I found what I learned with this is the biggest benefit to using this approach isn't really anything more than readability. Um, the smaller the pieces, the easier it was to say, right now I care about how I'm logging data. Therefore I want to go straight to the VI that logs data. It doesn't do anything else in there so I can ignore all of that noise and focus on the problem uh, at hand. So I've got a bit of an ex a few examples from some projects. I wanted to show some, some actual code that I worked on. And this is a nice example. So this is a, um, an alarm engine, if you like. So if you think we have some measurement values, in this case some temperature measurements, and really we're doing very simple comparisons of have we exceeded an alarm level, have we, are we below an alarm level, so there's a high, low, and I think there's a rate alarm at the end as well. And I thought I'd done quite a good job. Here I had a VI. Um, you can't quite see off the end here, but we have a class that's structuring the whole thing. That class has a high level alarm boolean, so we're tracking whether that alarm is fired. And we bring in the temperature and the time and we, we redo that comparison. An interesting thing happened. A custo the customer then asked for a new alarm. And I realized that actually, although I thought I'd broken this down quite well, I, that is not supposed to animate quite like that. <laughs> I actually had this same logic three or four different times. Because I had a high level alarm, a low level alarm, a pull down, so if it, it comes down fast enough in the temperature because this is for a freezer application. Um, and then this pull down stalled alarm, which means it's got stuck on the way down. Uh, so the logic here for the alarm is a bit cleverer. But you see, I've actually got a repetition here. Um, if I go back. I have this little AND gate that's really doing nothing more than saying, is this a new alarm? But I ended up repeating that code three or four times. The next request from the customer was, actually, the alarm can be in two states. It can be active and new, or I want to be able to ignore the alarm. So I had to add a clear state. In isolation, that's easy. I add another Boolean that says, is it cleared or not? But because I've got these four different alarms just floating around in this object, um, I had to repeat that work many times over. I had to revalidate all of that. So in this case, I ended up creating a new class called Alarm State. And in my previous mindset, I would have said this is too small. <laughs> and, you know, there's overhead in creating this. Um, in fact, the, there were actually just three methods and two items inside the class. Uh, whether it's activated or cleared, whether we want to raise an alarm, clear an alarm, and also just an easier method for reading whether it's active or not. But actually, by creating this small class, I think I improved a lot of areas. I could add the cleared functionality much easier, because I only have to do it once, so the classic case of modularity and, and having smaller components. Uh, I think it improves the readability of the code, actually. Now, rather than that slightly esoteric AND gate that every time I look at it, I have to try and remember what it's doing exactly. I just have a function that it says on it in plain text, raise alarm. Um, I'm actually a bit of a fan of using text on my icons a lot of the time because I just find it quicker to read, um, albeit internationalization issues and things like that, as pointed out. Um, but for me, that's not been an issue yet. Um, so very small, very simple but actually it nicely encapsulated this bit of functionality away from the rest. And with that, I got the improvement in, in readability and manageability. 
Um, I also find things like this actually much more useful than I imagined. This is kind of a classic case of encapsulation in OO. Rather than reading directly whether the alarm is active, by putting it in this function again, I get a nice easy <coughs> readability of code. I just get to see, because actually that's got to do a little bit more of a comparison with these booleans. Um, and I can just glance over the code and get a lot more information from it. Oh, sorry, in this one here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, why, so you suggested making that function a another class within your alarm module. Is that because you, want, you might want to have different types of logic in that function? That, that's it, yeah. So, well, um, let me check if I understand properly. So, so what I ended up doing is rather than having separate booleans in this alarm engine, I ended up with four alarm classes. Um, and all that's really doing is encapsulating this. Initially, all it was doing is really just encapsulating that one function. So it was a sub UI with a single node inside of it. Um, that's right, yeah. Exactly, it's purely handling, but, but exactly that. So the actual driving force <laughs> for me to refactor this was when they said, we actually want to have the alarm be able to be cleared as well. <coughs> so now this, although this starts out as one single node, now there's actually a couple of nodes inside that function, that um, raise alarm function. Does that answer your question? Yeah. <coughs> cool. So lesson two starts to sound a little bit less um, practical, <laughs> but bear with me. Uh, it, it does kind of... I've tried to find all these things that I think about, about every day, but I'm going to use a few more CSE terms, um, and I'll try, and try not to go into it too much. But um, Lesson two is des designing interfaces looking down. So to define a couple of terms in that, by an interface, what I'm really talking about in this case is my class and the selection of methods that I have for that class. Um, if you're not using classes, you still have interfaces, but it's your sub-VIs, the connector panes, and kind of how you structured that. Um, so it's really how one piece of software sees and interacts with another. What I mean by looking down is, is this is a really classic example, and I have code that I did like this, and, and I've spoken to other people starting out with OO, and they've started in a similar way, is my natural first reaction when I started trying to use these interfaces was, I have some test code, and that test code needs to talk to, in this case, a digital module, an NI472. So I think, okay, great, I create a class for the NI472, and I have a test class, and that talks to that. And what do we need to do with that? Well, we might need to configure some timing or write, some va write a value to a particular channel. The challenge with that is, actually, this is kind of an implementation detail from a software point of view. The software doesn't care that it's a NI9472. So now, as happened in my case when I, when I ran into this, they say, okay, we want to add a new module. It's basically doing the same thing, but maybe it's in temperature, mo oh, well, actually, my, the, with this it might be a faster digital module, or we might want to move it to PXI, in fact, was the case that I had this problem. Um, so now your code doesn't match reality. You've got an NI9472 uh, talking to a PXI DAT card. The other problem is now, it comes back to that same modularity problem. So I've got my logic for dealing with hardware here, but actually this is a very generic interface. This test code still has to know, well, if I want to switch this relay, what channel is that relay wired to? So it doesn't really help your readability. At this level, you're still having to de deal with hardware details. A better route with that might look something like this. So we've added an extra layer. Um, what actually happens here is our test code still talks and interacts with modules in its, at its level, if you like. <coughs> so the test code might decide, oh, we need to have control of a main switch, and we need to turn that switch on or turn that switch off. And so when you're up at the test level, you're reading, turn the switch on, 
you know, maybe take a measurement, turn the switch off. You're at the kind of same level of abstraction, if you like. Then if you care about how you turn the switch on, then within the main switch class, that talks to a DACMX component, in this case, is a slightly more general form of what we had here. And that's what decides, here's what channel that is on. Here's which channel we switch, and here's how we switch on that switch. Or maybe you have to use a couple of relays, and that logic is all encapsulated in there. So at test level, we don't care how it works. We just care that it does work, that it will switch on when we ask it. At the main switch level, then we care about a bit more detail. Again, kind of going back to the last example again, this makes everything a bit more modular again as well. So if you decide you need to change what channel the main switch is on, you only have to chase this class to find anywhere where that channel is defined, rather than your whole test program. Or if you want to expand to two test suites, you then have two main switch classes. Each one can be set up for a different um, area, uh, different pin, sorry. So by looking down, we tend to create code that's more readable. Um, and again, for me, this is all about, if I'm at the test level, I want to care about stuff that the test cares about. I don't want to deal with hardware details, I want to deal with the main switch. And that very much ties in with um, the idea of abstraction as well. So lesson three is, not mixing levels of abstraction. Really, this is a, a continuation of the same thing. Now, in some languages and design methods, they have very strictly defined layers of abstraction. Um, I've kind of highlighted <laughs> that here, but that isn't really what I'm saying you should do. You shouldn't be rigid with this, because I've seen people get in as much of a mess with that, and you end up with multiple layers where they aren't needed. Um, but this is really just more of a con conceptual level as you work through. So if we go back to my alarm system, we have an application, we have maybe a data acquisition process to manage the data, and we have our alarm engine. And by layers of abstraction, I'm thinking, well, at the application layer, um, we might need to initialize the application. We probably have two processes or two actors managing those two separate elements. Then in the middle, you have what could kind of be considered a model layer, or I prefer actually the term business logic. At this level, you're kind of not dealing with the hardware, but you're not dealing with the structural elements either. You're dealing with like the code I saw earlier. You know, if the temperature is above this, then set an alarm. If the data acquisition system is stopped, then start it. You're dealing with things in kind of a very kind of fluid engineering language, I guess, if you like. And at the bottom, we have the API layer, the interface to the outside world, if you like. Um, so in the case of, of this side, we might have the JSON library for managing the, the configuration. Uh, we might have DACMX for the DAC system. By understanding these layers, what we can do is stop them all bleeding together so much. Uh, let me give you a real example from one of my earlier projects was I had a cluster which was, I forget exactly what it contained. I think it was something to do with the direction. It was a DACMX configuration item anyway. And I said, okay, that's great. Well, I need that data in the alarm engine. And before I know it, I had that type def, worked all the way up here, all the way out to the DAC process, got sent over here to my alarm library. And now I can't use my alarm library without my DAC process. Or even worse, if you're using classes, they start locking each other because they start getting circular dependencies <laughs> and everything gets really tightly coupled. So what I do now by trying to understand these kind of layers and levels that we have is be very careful about what crosses those boundaries and how that interface is defined. And that helps reduce coupling between my different components. Um, and I have code sometimes that will just take a cluster and put it into a nearly identical cluster to cross this boundary, which on a one-off from an efficiency point of view, seems wasteful, but in reality, it's lightning quick and it's a huge benefit in terms of decoupling these different pieces. Another thing I like with all of these concepts is we can then get back to lab view as a flow diagram. 
it's kind of this concept that gets mentioned a lot at the start. And okay, in reality, when you learn a bit more, it's not quite a flow diagram. <laughs> Um, but it's still a powerful concept, and by worrying about these levels of abstraction, we can kind of keep levels of the code that are like a flow diagram. So again, rather than dealing with all the details of our data acquisition all the way through the application, we can have a level where we say we're going to read a waveform and save data. And you can show that to anybody, any other engineer on the team, and they understand the concept. And they might even be able to start making suggestions on how to improve it. But if you've got all this extra detail mixed in, it's much harder for them to understand. So again, it circles back around to readability. Um, that's one of the biggest benefits I've had from all of this, is my code is so much easier to read and therefore maintain out of these concepts. So I've got another little example of this. Again, this is real code. Um, this, I, I've tried throughout this not to give you polished or strange examples. This is me showing the progression I've made. Um, this is a piece of code where what we wanted to do was basically track real variables in memory. You know, it's a very common problem with about 50 bazillion different solutions um, out there, of different libraries and, and uh, different elements there. Uh, and in this case, what it was was we were going to have a number of different systems. Um, so we're going to have hundreds of these systems online. And so we need to create a variable table that could be duplicated for each of those systems and we could look it up. So the way we did that was we had a two tables which were actually uh, varying attribute tables. There was a fields table which was basically how we checked is a system online and what variables does it have. And then from that we could query the data table to find its actual values. And this function here is just to remove a system from the table. So a system's gone offline, therefore we need to delete its variables. There's quite a bit going on. It's not loads, it's not huge, but <coughs> there's a lot of different levels I have to think about. I have to explain to you what these two tables are, but at the same time I've had to, exp well, I haven't quite gone into the details of I have to think about, okay, not only is this a table, but actually this is a DVR, and we're using variants, and so I need to find the variants and delete the variant attributes from the table. And it's a lot of information. I, I, I like to treat myself as stupidly as possible now, actually. <laughs> if there's more information than I need, I like to get rid of some. So my tidied up version looks like this. And you could argue you could go a bit further, but essentially what I've done here is taken the the lower level complexity, the details of how we're putting information in a table or removing it from a table in this case. And I've just put it in sub BIs. So this time I can see my process for deleting a system from this table is to delete the system from the fields table and then the delete the data tags. <coughs> and I can explain that to you. And you could spot, oh actually that's a bit odd though because if we delete this system if the delete to the system fails, does that succeed? Or we can start to discuss how this flows at a much higher level without worrying about the details of quite how that implementation is done. <laughs> so it's much easier to spot bugs, I think, in this kind of much more modular system. And again, if I find I have a bug in the way I delete something from a table, I don't even have to care about this layer. I can dig straight down to the tables and say, oh, I've wired the error the wrong way or something like that. Um, so again, it's modularity, it's readability. There's a bit of a theme through all of this. Um, but it's something that I now think about on a much more regular basis um, than I did when I first started out. And take a small swing off topic. <laughs> and talk about a little pet topic of mine as well, um, is unit testing. I love unit testing. Um, I think it's something that, as a community, we need to understand and improve on over time. This tools, I'm not going to go on about it too much here, so <laughs> or try not to, um, but I wanted to give you a quick summary because for me this all fits together. I've spoken about modularity of code a lot. For me, one of the benefits of that is I now have smaller modules that are much easier for me to test. And by testing here, what I'm talking about is unit testing. 
So that is the idea that what I do is, as I write my code, I also write small additional pieces of code that will test what I've written. So when I wrote my alarm engine, I then also have three or four other VIs that exercises that in different ways. It will try raising an alarm and clearing it and make sure it comes back as cleared. It will try clearing alarm that's already cleared and make sure it doesn't throw an error or, or, or it does throw an error if that's what I want it to do. And by doing that as I go, and doing that in a way that I can automate, I can repeatedly push my test button and make sure I haven't broken anything. And I feel these two things go hand in hand because you need that modularity of code in order to be able to do that testing. Uh, if your code isn't modular, you're going to waste way more time on testing than you need to because um, you're going to have huge setup sequences before you can even perform the test that you want to do. The other thing that I'm trying to get better at, <laughs> and I still haven't mastered this, is also the idea of refactoring a bit more as I go as well. Um, so there's a concept called test-driven development, and the idea there is once your test passes, then look at your code and decide if you've done it the best way. And in reality, most of the time, it's a two-minute look, and maybe you'll decide, oh, I should have an extra sub-VI here, or that doesn't quite read as well as it could. But it means next time you come back to maintain it, the code is better. <coughs> and in some of my examples, perhaps if I'd have stopped when I started that alarm engine and realized I duplicated code, I might have solved that while I was already in the right mindset, rather than having to come back and solve that when actually there's a new feature that needs to be added. So I've delayed adding the new feature in order to have to change that first. So it's not something I'm perfect at. Um, <laughs> it's something I'm working on. Um, and unit test testing generally, feel free to talk to me about it afterwards. I will talk your ear off about it. Um, the tools we have in LabVIEW aren't great and make this harder than it should be. Um, but personally, I'm still trying to persevere and hopefully we'll get some better tools and I think it's a valuable tool, valuable methodology going forward. My final lesson <laughs> for this, for the benefits of is actually learning from others. Um, I, this is something I hadn't perceived going in, but by learning object-oriented programming, or, so, I've talked a lot about object-oriented design in LabVIEW. I actually think probably most of the people in the room do this, whether they call it that or not. You have ways of breaking down software into components and defining those interfaces. If we understand what we're doing a little bit more with object-oriented programming or even object-oriented design and understanding a bit of the terminology, now I find I have a much more vast selection of resources that can help me. Because now I share a language with people using C++, using Java, JavaScript. And that means that some of these books, um, I mean, these, these are just some of the best books I've found or read, have been a lot more beneficial to me. Um, it means we can look outside of the lab view world to understand a bit more about software design, which you can do even without. Personally, I just found it beneficial. Uh, it helps with that even more. To reference a couple of the specific books, Code Complete is one of the best books I've read. I really, really like this because it does cover root. It also covers things like it's as simple as error handling, variable naming. Um, it really is a good start to finish. Um, I mean, I didn't read it start to finish, don't you? <laughs> but, uh, um, it's a really good introductory book at any level. Um, I don't think I've ever finished it. I've just jumped to sections that I found interesting and dug into them a little bit more. And it, gives you a little bit more of a gradual introduction to some of these techniques as well, um, which, which I found really useful. The, um, he does a, a video blog for constructs. Oh, okay, yeah. If you look into that, that is mostly aimed at project management. Quite, mm. quite a lot of agile, but yeah. it's worth a look. Okay, I haven't seen that, I'll have to look at that, yeah. Um, refactoring, I mentioned testing and refactoring. This one, I would say is about 20% useful for us. The rest is, is a lot of examples in Java, I think that one is. Um, but it's still interesting and it still gives me, I, I've still been able to benefit from it because I have this, this common language with it. And Agile software development is quite a classic one. If you're really keen on it, it's worth trying to read this. It's very, very heavy. 
And what I will say is the book progresses much faster than you will. So what I've ended up doing is I've kind of read the start of it, and I've got to the, the, the point of where, where I am. Um, it introduces something called the solid principles, which are design principles, which is kind of what this presentation is about. A lot of what I've talked about relates quite strongly to those. Um, so then I read that bit, and I worked on that for a bit. Now I need to return to it, and it will start talking about design patterns and things. But, so don't treat it like, oh, I don't know what half of this book's on about, because you won't. You need to take it step by step and kind of work at it in that way. Um, but broadly speaking, you know, like I say, there's a lot of books, there's a lot of blogs out there, information that then becomes accessible to us if we're, if we're sharing a common language with the developers. Um, again, yeah, like I say, especially refactoring, a lot of the examples are obviously, well, none of the examples, shall we say, are in LabVIEW, other than a very few select LabVIEW books that exist um, out in the market. But if you can read a bit of C style, style syntax, you can normally still grasp the concept of what they're doing. Um, <coughs> and learn more from the community. I have a various presence. I, I have a blog, which I haven't updated in a very long time, uh, <laughs> relatively speaking, although my plan is to turn this talk into a few blog posts and go into a little bit more detail on a couple of the concepts. Um, Go to the NI community, there is obviously CSLUG, your local use group will be on there. Um, there's a good unit testing <coughs> group on there. Uh, there used to be a page with a lot of OP stuff, although I haven't found myself there very often lately. Um, and yeah, learn from the people around you. Uh, obviously that's kind of the theme of this track as well. Um, and again, I think that will, will help with bouncing these concepts, bouncing these ideas off people. And that is about all I've got, which I'm a little bit early. It's not uh, work. Get bonus points for it, Any other questions? Yeah. yeah. Are you a fan of active framework or do you? <laughs> <laughs> I am not a massive fan of the main active framework. I find it too hard to understand what's going on. I think the only way you can use active framework is to have a load of design diagrams to explain it, and that's a valuable thing anyway. I, I mean, if I have any parallel system, I just can't understand the timing until I actually make normally like a sequence diagram or, or something like that and understand the interactions. So, Actor Framework puts some OO patterns together very specifically to do what it does, um, but I do find them a little bit obtuse in that. Maybe I'll change my mind when I understand a little bit more of the pattern side of things, but um, personally, I still think you don't benefit much over a QMH type system or one of another of under other actor systems out there. Um, but the parallel system and having parallel QMHs, so the concept of actor oriented design, people have used to great use, and I think there's something in that. I just am not a massive fan of the specific framework. So I don't use it there. <laughs> um, it can be applied. So there's a technical level and a conceptual level. On a technical level, it can be applied. Most of the same stuff works other than anything dynamic. So there's a concept called dynamic dispatch, um, which doesn't work on an FPGA because it has to be predetermined, because it has to be programmed in that way. Um, personally, I have found that the logic I put on the FPGA is simple enough that I don't feel the need for the extra structure, although I might organize it into libraries, but not explicitly classes. Um, but it can be applied, and there's no technical reason not to, other than personally, I think it will, I don't get enough benefit from it, if you like. Um, and there are some funny things with classes on multiple targets, and I do use them on real time, and I kind of just deal with the headaches. <laughs> I think they'll probably get worse again on FPGA, so I've tended to avoid it. Uh, that's an interesting one. Do you, do you keep uh, your classes in different targets? Do you have like two projects, or do you keep, keep them in one project? So, I have. The, 
the projects I've had with a lot of real time, I, have net, I haven't shared classes between the two targets. And I'm trying to think whether I've done that by design or whether it's a bit more of an accident of the way it's worked. It's probably a little bit of both. I mean, personally, in that case, I would, simp I would do whatever I could to avoid reusing them across two targets. Because then, you, what happens, and I think you know but <laughs> better than everyone else, is you, if you have a class loaded on, the co on my computer target and on a real-time target, it locks it. So you can't change what's in the class, you can't add sub BIs um, to it. And it's uh, an absolute nightmare to do it work with. So you would be forced to really either have two projects, maybe one for my computer and one for the target, or what I'd be tempted to do is see, well, if this is a reuse component, maybe I would have its own project and use kind of a built output at that point. Um, but it's, neither is a nice solution. <laughs> So I've tended to try and design around that and, and not reuse classes between uh, projects, um, <laughs> unless it is in a reuse library explicitly. I think you kind of answered it before, actually, because that where I've come across that if you would use some uh, like a set in here, that just happens to be a one-tier. Yes. Like, good at getting through your entire code in cases like that. So yeah, in that sort of case, what I would be looking to do is, is at the translation level, I would actually have two separate ones on both sides. Obviously, you have to be very careful then if you're, say, flattening it over TCP that they're kept in sync. It, it's a little bit riskier. Um, but that's what I've done in that case, is I have just maintained two copies, because it, yeah, it's, it's too much hard work, unfortunately, in LabVIEW. Uh, but it's a problem with the IDE, you know, that, that, that's, I, I know smart people who are aware of this problem, so I'm guessing it's not an easy one to be solved, but uh, unfortunately, we have to live with it for now. Any other questions? I hope that wasn't too rapid. <laughs> Gives you some ideas. And my overall thing with it would be, you can take small steps. Don't feel like you've got to start with the Active Framework. You know, just start replacing an FGV with a class or, you know, find those little steps and get happy with the base concepts because otherwise, if you start trying to use higher concepts for them without getting a feel for the base concepts, you're going to get in a mess. <laughs> Thank you very much. organizational mode. <laughs> Presentations, are they all going to go up on the community page somewhere or just part of the NI Days page, do you know? Or? Uh, the videos are probably going to go on the YouTube one if somebody gives me somewhere extra. Okay. Um, and I'll probably think yeah. It's, it's maybe nice to have as a PDF as well. Yeah, I think they normally do something yeah, with NI Days, they'll they? PDF them all yeah, and send around a link afterwards. Yeah. I, I, I need a copy of that really because I've got the first few I've got to win. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Not, not, not guaranteed. Yeah, do, do. Because I don't think we talk about it enough. Um, the one talk I found really interesting that kind of comes into that was at NRO Week. Oh, what's his name on the community? Someone did one on packages. Yeah, which is fine. as an OO content. Excellent now. But I would love to see that simplified down output kind of put aside the domain a bit as well because it's it's related. It's what goes together and what should talk to each other and what should never talk to each other and yeah, I think that'd be really interesting. Yeah. I think that would be really interesting. What I've done to avoid using type different stuff is all of the interfaces on all the type that's done by methods. Okay. So you can the the layer of the can interact with the class methods. Yeah. Then because it doesn't own the class. Or you can't then push it further. Yes. Yeah, that's just my way. Yeah, Tolly Deps I found it the particularly insidious thing. Um, I've been very careful. When you first start learning, they always say you have to have the cross shape of the eye. And then you get to larger projects, you still learn. But the idea that it's tight, but it's just as easy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I've got that from a few times. <laughs> well, it tends to. Well, well, this is it. It, it tends to build it. It tends to be a part of the cluster, I, I guess. So I would have some sort of. The other classic one is configuration. So I have a configuration cluster, and because I'm starting out, I have a big configuration cluster for everything, and then that inherently ends up affecting everything. Um, or I have, again, it's kind of this. When you start programming, everything gets pushed on, so a lot of stuff gets pushed on both forwards. So you've got this cluster, you're like, well, it needs 90% of it, so I'll give it the whole thing so I'm not wasting time. Yeah, it's 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 a very simple thing. It's a very large thing. Yeah, it's all right. 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 It's Yes. Yeah. That's the best fun I've had <laughs> for weeks. <laughs> writing your CV. Um,